sais pas comment ça marche. J'attends de voir. You're happy with that microphone, yeah? Mm -hmm. Philippe? Happy with that? Yeah, it's open, I guess. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this panel, Can You Trust the Media? Uh, sorry we're a little late starting, but uh, like any controversy, uh, getting everyone uh, here is uh, not quite as simple as just asking them to come up and sit behind the desk. Um, the main thing we'll be looking at this evening is uh, a story that was broadcast back in 2000, nine years ago now. Uh, featuring a young boy, Mohamed al -Dura. It was a report on the French network France 2, and uh, it was by a reporter called Charles Ondelin, and it's been the subject of intense debate in France and uh, in the international media. And to give you an idea of what's at the heart of it, uh, the best thing to do is to show you the film and then we'll have a very brief uh, statement from Philippe uh, Visseras, who is the Rome correspondent of France 2 and he'll just explain why it is that France 2 are not going to participate in tonight's panel debate um, although they were obviously invited to do so. So without further ado can we have a look at the 55 second film from 2000 15h tout vient de basculer près de l'implantation de Netsarim dans la bande de Gaza les palestiniens ont tiré à balles réelles les israéliens ripostent ambulanciers, journalistes et simples passants sont pris entre deux feux Ici, Jamal et son fils Mohamed sont la cible de tirs venus de la position israélienne. Mohamed a 12 ans, son père tente de le protéger. Il fait des signes, mais une nouvelle rafale. Mohamed est mort et son père gravement blessé. That's the film. Not very long for something that's involved nine years of dispute. Philippe, can I just ask you to explain uh, to people here France 2's position on, on this film and on the subsequent uh, case? Buonasera a tutti. Io sono il corrispondente per l'Italia del, del canale francese France 2, servizio pubblico di televisione francese, un po' come la RAI in Italia, per quelli che non ci conoscono. Io vengo specialmente da Roma per dirvi perché non siamo seduti qua, a questo tavolo questa sera. Ehm, noi abbiamo una causa in corso, un conflitto in giustizia con il signor Cassanti che ci accusa di aver eh, mentito e di aver partecipato ad una messa in scena, eh, che questi fatti non sono veri. Allora, io vorrei soltanto dire che I dibattiti sono stati di, di, due, cioè di due nature. La prima riguarda l'origine dei tiri e degli spari. Vedete che la prima sera il nostro corrispondente eh, a Gerusalemme dice che sono stati gli israeliani a sparare. Poi già dall'indomani sono apparsi dei dubbi e noi li abbiamo riferiti in onda, abbiamo fatto servizi, ogni volta che sono apparsi nuovi elementi, nuovi dubbi sull'origine di questi tiri. Quando c'è stata una commissione d'inchiesta dell'esercito israeliano della quale abbiamo parlato, alla quale abbiamo dato la parola e che ha concluso alla fine che non si poteva sapere con certezza chi aveva sparato. Il problema non era questo, perché questo dibattito l'abbiamo accettato cioè, normalmente, non siamo infallibili e abbiamo provato di dare ogni informazione che avevamo. Il problema è stato quando le accuse del signor Cassanti si sono fatte, hanno cambiato natura. Lui ha detto che, quindi come vi dicevo all'inizio, Questo non è vero, che eh, è una messa in scena, che queste persone sono 
recitano una scena come, che, che, non, che sono attori, insomma, che non è morto il ragazzo, il giovane Mohamed che vedete, e che noi siamo stati i complici di questa messa in scena, di questa scena di teatro, perché è il nostro cameraman di Gaza che ha ripreso queste immagini. Allora, lì la, siamo andati in giustizia per dire che eh, è impossibile eh, mettere così in dubbio, cioè per diffamazione, per mettere in dubbio la nostra onestà su questa cosa. C'è stato un giudizio di primo grado dove è stato, lui è stato accusato di, 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 di condannato per diffamazione, ha fatto appello, la sentenza d'appello, il giudice ha ritenuto che aveva il diritto di esprimere, di, non era, eh, abbiamo pro, proposto recentemente che il padre del giovane ragazzo che è stato ucciso, che è stato ferito al braccio, fosse eh, esaminato in qualsiasi eh, ospedale da, nel mondo, da medici. Per esempio, eh, abbiamo pro proposto recentemente che il padre del giovane ragazzo che è stato ucciso, che è stato ferito al braccio, fosse eh, esaminato in qualsiasi eh, ospedale da, nel mondo, da medico, per esumare la salma di suo figlio, cioè una cosa eccezionale, nella la cultura musulmana non si esumano i corpi, quindi lui ha avuto l'autorizzazione la, la, eccezionale del Mufti di Gaza per fare un prelievo del DNA per accettare che si trattava di suo figlio. E ci, allora, loro ci dicono ma tanto non serve a niente perché magari quello che è morto è Now, Philippe, è il I'm, I'm going to have to stop you there for okay, a minute because, allora io devo because dire perché... you did say to me when you sì. said you were coming here that you were going to explain that for legal reasons France sì. 2 couldn't come and you've given a very, very brilliant and full uh, explanation of France 2's entire position which is sorry, I'm sorry you couldn't make from the panel Um, but I know that your, uh, your bosses allora, in, in Paris uh, obviously aren't willing to do that. But I think, frankly, if you're not willing to take part in the panel debate, giving you uh, 10 minutes to uh, outline your case is a little unfair to the other participants in the allora, panel. I think. Mi uh, soltanto terminare. Okay. Yeah. Quindi, soltanto per finire, le persone che sono accusate sono il nostro corrispondente di Gerusalemme che è un ottimo giornalista, lui ha fatto dei libri, dei documentari eh, che sono stati tradotti dappertutto nel mondo, eh, il cameraman, eh, e lui ha la doppia cittadinanza francese ed israeliana. Il cameraman di Gaza eh, è uno dei pochi palestinesi di Gaza ancora oggi che, sono, che, che è autorizzato ad uscire di Gaza da, dallo Stato di Israele, quindi per dire che non è ritenuto un militante politico e ha lavorato tre mesi fa per eh, CNN, il il canale americano che voi conoscete tutti. Noi facciamo errori, cioè, non, non è che sto dicendo che non si può parlare di queste cose, se ne può, può parlare per ore, noi facciamo errori e lo riconosciamo come lo facciamo. Tre mesi fa, per esempio, c'è stato, eh, durante l'offensiva israeliana a Gaza, noi abbiamo usato in un servizio delle immagini di, di, di miliziani del Hamas che noi pensavamo essere di, di, di attualità di questo conflitto. Infatti erano immagini di repertorio che noi avevamo preso su internet. Ci siamo sbagliati e ci siamo scusati l'indomani. Abbiamo spiegato ai telespettatori perché. Quindi il problema non è di non parlare di queste cose, di ritenere che i giornalisti sono infallibili. I giornalisti commettono errori perché sono uomini. Eh, ma di difendere la nostra onestà e la nostra professionalità. Adesso vi ringrazio tutti e vi lascio per questo dibattito, al quale purtroppo io, per i motivi legali che vi ho spiegati, non posso, al quale non posso partecipare. Grazie, Philippe. Come uh, you can see from Philippe's uh, statement, uh, there is an enormous amount of controversy around these pictures. Um, France 2 unfortunately couldn't make that fulsome statement from up here, apparently for legal reasons. Um, and uh, you'll hear the other side of the coin from, from one of the panelists today. Just to give you some background on uh, the Aldera case, you probably heard some there from, uh, from Philippe, but uh, Charles Onderland, who's the correspondent involved, wasn't with the cameraman when this piece was filmed. And perhaps you know, nine years on, in a more transparent time for journalism, it might have been made more evident in that report that he wasn't actually there to witness the scenes that he reported on. And 
you know, if you look at the way television news has changed, there's a lot more appreciation of the sophistication of audiences and of their need to know exactly where the people who are telling them something are coming from. Now, to talk about this uh, and to talk around some of the issues that are raised by the accusations made by Philippe Carsanti, um, who's here on my left, and uh, I would just say to everyone, I've turned my phone off, and if you haven't turned your phone to silent, please could you, so we don't hear the embarrassing ring tune ringing out. Uh, so joining me, Yvonne Rafoul, who's a columnist from Le Figaro in, uh, in France, leading French media commentator, something of a maverick, uh, in the French media establishment, and he's written about uh, this controversy. On my left, Philippe Carsanti, who has waged uh, what I suppose is a, is a one-man campaign on this particular case, um, and uh, who, has, uh, who was uh, taken to court for libel by France Tour and, uh, and won on appeal, although there's currently a final appeal undergoing, which is uh, why Philippe felt it necessary to uh, talk for 10 minutes and then leave. And then finally we have Udo Tromboli, who's a senior correspondent, distinguished foreign correspondent uh, from Il Sole. Uh, my apologies for speaking to you in English. It's because if you heard me speak Italian, you'd burst into tears. Um, I, my name's Adrian Monk, and I am a professor of journalism and author of Can You Trust the Media, but for 20 years I was a television journalist, so I know a little bit about television news. I reported from Bosnia, from all over the Middle East, from Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm well versed in uh, conflicts and their reporting, and uh, I've even seen people do bad things on television before, so I know a little bit about some of the tricks and uh, uh, if you like, uh, some of the, the fakery um, of television news. So I'm here as moderator not to uh, give you the benefit of my, uh, my views and I want to start by getting some opinions from the panel and probably the best response to Philippe is to give you the other side of, uh, of the argument which is presented by Philippe Carsanti. So Philippe, can you just tell us... Uh, why it is that you and, uh, and the other Philippe are not uh, on panel terms. Okay, so you give me five minutes just to expose this? Okay. So first, we agreed before, first I'd like to thank you and thank you very much to the festival and to you, Adrian, and to everybody here to attend. I'm not a journalist, so, uh, well, I agree. I'm very happy to be welcome here. So uh, we agreed that we will not make the presentation that I had at the court or that I'm having lecturing all over the world. So we agreed with Chris that tomorrow in the same room at 9 o'clock, we're going to uh, screen a full presentation of most of the evidence that we have, that the news report that you've seen here is completely staged. So now, just to give you the version of Friends 2. So the version of Friends 2 is that the father and the boy that you're seeing here have been targeted by the Israeli soldiers for 45 minutes, sh shot and targeted. The cameraman, Talal Abu Rahma, who's working for France 2, and at that time was also working for CNN, said that he filmed 27 minutes of the incident. When he got the film, he sent it to CNN and to France 2. CNN refused to broadcast the news report. It was Mike Hanna at that time the bureau chief in Jerusalem, and Mike Hanna said, we want guarantees of authenticity, we don't think it's true. Uh, just that you know, Mike Hanna now works for Al Jazeera. So, in their accu international, sorry, yeah. Uh, in their accusation, they're saying that the Israeli soldiers and the father, there's a distance between them of 80 meters, okay? And at the end, the father received 12 bullets and the boy three. So, I'd like to tell you that all that I'll screen tomorrow and uh, all on what I'm basing have never been contested anywhere, nor by the French justice, nor by France, nobody ever contested our evidence. 
So I'm going to tell you now the incoherences and the inconsistencies of this news report. First, you can see that there is, they pretend that they receive 15 bullets altogether, and you can see no impact, no blood. You can also see that they received bullets from the right-hand side of the screen at an angle of 30 degrees, but they didn't move from one centimeter on the left. I mean, if I'm pushing Adrian, he moves a little bit, but when he received, if he received 12 bullets, he just, he would move very much further. Okay, so the position of the hand of the boy here, you can see he's holding his hand in front of his eyes. It's not a position that is possible when you're dead. Ask to any medical doctor. When you're dead, you cannot have your hand on your, over your eyes like this. We have 10 more seconds of the boy after he, they pretend he dies. He's doing exactly this, and if you come tomorrow, you'll see this. He's doing this. He's raising his elbow, turning his face towards the camera, and putting him down. And after, in the last image, when you see Mohammed al jura you see his foot up over the ground, which is not possible when you're dead. They claim that the Israeli soldier shot for 45 minutes, but you have only eight bullet holes, which means less than one every five minutes, which is completely ridiculous. We had the first uh, ballistic expert in France who testified for us that if only one soldier, and they had more than 10 soldiers in the campaign, only one soldier, we should have seen 2,000 bullet holes on the wall. You can see that the bullet holes are round instead of being um, off. In their accusation, they're saying that the Israeli soldiers and the father, there is a distance between them of 80 meters. Okay? And at the end, the father received 12 bullets and the boy, three. So, I'd like to tell you that all that I'll screen tomorrow and uh, all on what I'm basing have never been contested anywhere, nor by the French justice, nor by France. Nobody ever contested our evidence. So I'm going to tell you now the incoherences and the inconsistencies of this news report. First, you can see that there is, they pretend that they receive 15 bullets altogether and you can see no impact, no blood. You can also see that they received bullets from the right-hand side of the screen at an angle of 30 degrees, but they didn't move from one centimeter on the left. I mean, if I'm pushing Adrian, he moves a little bit, but when he received, if he received 12 bullets, he just, he would move very much further. Okay, so the position of the hand of the boy here, you can see he's holding his hand in front of his eyes. It's not a position that is possible when you're dead. Ask to any medical doctor. When you're dead, you cannot have your hand on your, over your eyes like this. We have 10 more seconds of the boy after they pretend he dies. He's doing exactly this, and if you come tomorrow, you'll see this. He's doing this. He's raising his elbow, turning his face towards the camera, and putting him down. And after, in the last image, when you see Mohammed al jura you see his foot up over the ground, which is not possible when you're dead. They claim that the Israeli soldier shot for 45 minutes, but you have only eight bullet holes, which means less than one every five minutes, which is completely ridiculous. We had the first a ballistic expert in France who testified for us that if only one soldier, and they had more than 10 soldiers in the camp, only one soldier, we should have seen 2,000 bullet holes on the wall. You can see that the bullet holes are round instead of being um, oval, because they were, the bullets, if they came from the Israeli side, they would have had an oval shape and not a round shape, which, which shows perpendicular shape. France two witnesses that they brought to the court said that the Israeli soldier shot at them, and I have the document, with planes, missiles, anti-tank missiles, and helicopters. But you still have eight bullet holes. Um, you can see also in the film that we'll watch again after that not any very important moment is filmed. You never see the moment when the boy or the father received the bullet, and you don't see the moment when the ambulance comes, and they claim that they bled for 17 minutes. So Talal Abu Rahma claimed that he filmed 27 minutes. At the court, when they were summoned by the court to bring the, the tapes, they deleted nine minutes and they just brought 18 minutes to the court. In those 18 minutes, you have less than one minute about Mohammed al -Dura. So it's another lie of France too. So as I said, you have the 10 seconds of the move of the boy, but very interesting, the two following seconds after the 10 seconds, the boy and the father are not behind the barrel and the rough material of France too. 
Not at all. And there is not a single drop of blood on the wall. And you don't have the 15... Yeah, no, yeah, but there is, yeah, they cut, no, they cut, yeah, of course, no, wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you can ask, so you can ask all your questions, yeah, wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm telling you in the raw material of France too, they decided to cut, as I said, they always cut when it's interesting, and they said that they bled for 17 minutes, and you can see that after the father and the boy are not there, I'm sorry if I forget to say that they cut, but they decided to cut, and there is not a single drop of blood, and you don't see those 15 bullet holes that you should see behind. I would tell you something more, and after I'm almost finished, that uh, France 2 shows a boy at the morgue. Recently, a month ago exactly, the ARD, the public German TV, uh, made a whole documentary uh, about this film, about this movie, and they conclude, like me, that it's a complete stage hoax, and they had a biometrician uh, who compared the face. And he realized that the face of the boy filmed by France 2 is completely different than the boy, it's, I'm sorry, it's true, complete, it's saved by ARD, and it's completely different from the face that you see at the morgue. And we have so ballistic experts, forensic experts, and something which is interesting that they also raised in the ARD document. This thing you can hear at the beginning, Three o'clock, everything starts at uh, Nizarin Junction. It's confirmed by the shapes, by the shade, okay? The shade confirmed that it's three o'clock. But the guy that they received at the morgue of Gaza, and it's confirmed also by ARD, by everyone, arrived at the hospital at 10 a.m. So the boy that they are claiming who's Mohammed al it arrived at 10, 10 a.m. in the morning, dead at the morgue, and then after, at 3 o'clock, he's playing this scene. So we are, we are talking about two different kids. If you just allow me just to answer a few of the points of Philippe, and it's very, 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 sh very short. Yes. Can I stop you for a minute? Yes, say, For those people in the audience who think there are only two versions of events, of course. Uh, there are many more versions of events than you're getting from Philippe and Philippe. The, uh, the initial uh, IDF, Israeli uh, military spokesman, uh, admitted the shooting and apologized for the shooting. An Israeli Defense Force investigation found that Mohammed al Dura had been killed, but not by Israeli soldiers, by Palestinian soldiers. So, throughout this whole uh, developing saga, if you like, there are many, many different views, some of them official from the Israeli Defense Force, some of them from analysis of video, some of them from uh, France 2 and their cameraman, some of them from ARD and people who've looked uh, at issues around the video itself. But the reason we're talking about it here at the Journalism Festival is really because the contest and the transparency are what we're interested in as, as journalists. And Philippe's campaign has raised some very serious doubts and questions about the authenticity of the material in question. And it also raises some very interesting questions about what happens when members of the public, lobbyists, uh, campaigners take on big public broadcasters, big public journalism organizations. And I think those are questions that all of us as journalists need to, need to look at. And I want to stop before we get into the direction of bullets and the puffing of smoke before you all uh, become ballistics experts and forensic experts, because we have to accept that uh, if you go and see Philippe's presentation, you might well be convinced of, of his case. And if you, uh, if you listen further and research further on Philippe uh, and Franz Deux's case, you may well be convinced of theirs or come somewhere in the middle. But uh, this is about journalism. And as journalists, I want to keep it talking about some of the issues because there are very important issues here about the role of people reporting in conflict zones. You know, I reported in Northern Ireland as a, a British passport holder. Um, I've worked with many people who are in fact nationals and party to conflicts and there are huge conflicts of interest and important problems and equally pressures brought to bear on people in those areas. So these are all the things that I think this case brings up as issues for journalists and I want to thank Philippe for kind of raising them because I think he's raised some important questions. 
And if I can, I'd just like to turn to uh, Ugo Tromboli to get a, his perspective on this debate, and perhaps Ugo can speak as someone who's got more of an overview on, on, on this. Um, thank you, Adrian. Um, I'm sorry about that, but I, in, um, um, we, in support with uh, France 2, who decided to speak Italian rather than English and French, I will speak Italian too. Uh, because I think, uh, I mean, just to be more, more firm, sorry about that, but we have a wonderful translator here. Um, io non volevo venire qua, ero stato invitato, infatti nel programma non c'è il mio nome, eh, perché non volevo partecipare a questo dibattito. Poi all'ultimo momento ci ho ripensato perché credo che sia giusto eh, partecipare a questo dibattito, che sia giusto che un giornalista non si debba eh, sottrarre anche al peggiore dei dibattiti. Per questo, seppure manifestando la mia solidarietà ai colleghi di France 2, eh, credo che sia sbagliato a non partecipare, la mettono sul piano legale, legalistico, però secondo me avrebbero dovuto partecipare a questo dibattito. E credo che questo abbia anche molto a che fare col ruolo di noi giornalisti, come, eh, come giustamente ha detto Adrian, eh, in zone di guerra, ehm, come ci comportiamo, cosa facciamo. E questo, questa storia mette in discussione anche questo, indubbiamente. Eh, e sappiamo benissimo quanto, quante volte anche le immagini possono essere modificate, essere falsificate. Eh, poiché conosco giornalisti che scrivono reportage o reportage perfino di guerra dalle loro camere d'albergo, ritengo che ci possano anche essere colleghi della stampa televisiva che lo facciano. Quindi eh, credo che sia giusto che ci confrontiamo. E capisco Adrian quando vuole cercare, essendo lui un egregio insegnante, vi, vi auguro a tutti voi studenti qua di andare alla sua scuola di giornalismo, cerchi di portare la questione su quello che in fondo interessa in generale a questo, in questo bellissimo incontro del Festival di Giornalismo. Però proprio perché in questa sala eh, ci sono molti giovani che fanno già le scuole di giornalismo, o sono giovani giornalisti o vogliono fare i giornalisti, io credo che fosse importante... So there you have conclusive proof it is impossible to host a debate about the Middle East without talking about politics. Um, thanks to Ugo for giving us, I think, uh, a more, uh, an overview of, of his position as, as a journalist and as a, a correspondent. I want to turn to uh, Ivan, uh, who's going to be talking to us in French. So if you're fluent in French, congratulations. I'm going to rely on my, my earphones. Um, Yvonne's uh, position is as a, as, is a kind of media commentator, outsider in the French media, uh, looking in. And he perhaps can explain a little bit about why this particular case is such a cause celebre in France itself, and perhaps what's different about France and the French media that's made this quite the, the case that it is. So, Yvonne, can I hand over to you to... Uh, uh, towards the audience. Merci beaucoup. Euh, Pardonnez-moi de ne parler en, en français, j'ai un très mauvais italien et, et mon anglais aussi. J'espère que vous avez des écouteurs. Euh, comme vous avez pu le constater, il y a autour de cette affaire, et très curieusement, une énorme passion. Euh, on en est effectivement, je regrette moi aussi, comme mon confrère, que France 2 n'est pas accepté de participer au débat et en fait euh, il reproduit là d'ailleurs euh, un comportement qui est de, dès le départ pose le problème de, 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 des médias je voudrais généraliser ce, cette affaire en fait qui est assez qui illustre assez bien le fait de savoir si oui ou non les médias doivent doivent pouvoir se remettre en cause ah oui pardon pose plus généralement le problème de savoir si les médias doivent rendre des comptes de, leur, de leurs informations. J'entendais tout à l'heure notre confrère de France 2 dire qu'il n'était pas possible de mettre en doute notre honnêteté. Si, il est possible aujourd'hui pour tout journaliste d'être mis en doute, non pas sur son honnêteté, mais d'être mis en doute sur sa, sur ses, sur sa parole, sur la manière qu'il a de, re, de retracer les faits, de, de donner les informations naturellement. Et cette réflexion qu'il a eue, ce, ce refus qu'il a eu de débattre, est très significatif 
d'une sorte de dérive de notre profession qui s'enferme dans une sorte de cité interdite et qui pense avoir la vérité révélée et de, mais qui refuse de faire la moindre, le, le, la moindre autocritique en plus sur des sujets aussi délicats que, ce, que celui de, de l'affaire Aldoura. Je m'empresse de dire que je n'ai aucune opinion sur l'affaire Aldoura. Euh, je ne sais pas qui, qui vivrait là, dans cette affaire-là, mais je trouve qu'il est légitime d'en débattre et je trouve qu'il est légitime d'ailleurs qu'il y ait une commission d'enquête pour savoir qui euh, de, 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 tous les, de tous les intervenants euh, dit le vrai. Je voudrais tout de même rappeler, parce que ça n'a pas été dit, quel est le contexte de cette de cette affaire euh, cette, et l'impact énorme qu'il y a eu donc ça s'est passé en 2000 ça a été juste un petit peu avant euh, la deuxième intifada, ça a été d'ailleurs un des éléments de la, de la reprise de la deuxième intifada euh, ça, ça, donc c'est France, France 2 a diffusé ce, ce, ce document dont les images ont été reprises ensuite notamment par quand les, les égorgeurs de, 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 du journaliste américain Daniel Pearl euh, se sont mis devant leur caméra de télévision, devant leur petite caméra vidéo, il y avait la photo de, de Mohamed Aldoura qui était derrière et qui justifiait donc leur haine, leur haine du juif qui était euh, Daniel Pearl. Et donc cette, euh, cette image-là a été naturellement instrumentalisée, a été diffusée partout dans le monde pour montrer que les juifs étaient, étaient des, des tueurs d'enfants. Donc il y avait quand même, en désignant euh, d'une manière très, très légère l'armée israélienne comme étant euh, l'auteur des tirs, en Berlin a fait une faute déjà. Il a fait non seulement une faute, mais il a fait une faute parce qu'il n'était pas sur place. C'est une faute qui aurait pu être bénie s'il l'avait admise, mais c'est son, son caméraman qui filme la scène, c'est son caméraman donc qui est palestinien, membre du Fatah, qui, signe la, qui, qui filme cette scène, qui lui retrace ensuite le déroulement de cette scène, et lui, dans son commentaire, croit son caméraman. Le Berda dans, dans la profession de journaliste, malgré tout, c'est de, 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 de recouper ses sources et en tout cas de, de, de ne pas faire confiance pour un, un sujet aussi grave. Bon, la faute, la faute dans Berlin, de mon point de vue, elle est là. Non, je ne vais pas l'aborder les leçons, mais pour essayer de faire comprendre les, les problèmes. Il y a ensuite la faute de France 2, parce que j'entends mon confrère de France 2 dire que France 2 avait accepté de reconnaître que euh, il y avait tout ça n'était pas très clair. C'est pas, enfin, à ma connaissance, ce n'est pas vrai. Il y, a, il y a deux affaires dans ce, dans, dans ce drame. Il y a d'abord la première accusation de savoir si l'armée israélienne a oui ou non tiré sur cet enfant et là les, 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 les expertises balistiques semblent prouver que en tout cas ça paraît compliqué, en tout cas qu'il y a un doute et ce doute m'a habité, moi quand on m'a expliqué effectivement de voir que de, de la beauté des positions des israéliens, ils ne pouvaient pas voir cet enfant ils ne pouvaient pas être sous le feu de leur, de leur fusil donc il y a ce problème ce premier débat qui aurait dû en tout cas être euh, de, de, amener France 2 à faire amende honorable et, et dire qu'il l'avait accusé sans preuve l'armée israélienne puis il y a cet autre débat aujourd'hui de savoir si c'est une scène euh, une scène macabre mais une scène fictive euh, comme, on a, comme on peut en voir c'est vrai que quand vous voyez les rushs de ce qui se passe euh, chez les petits palestiniens ils minent souvent et ça je l'ai vu bien sûr euh, des fausses blessures pour ensuite euh, repartir euh, courir et se, se rouler à nouveau par terre devant les caméras, il y a une sorte de jeu médiatique, sachant que, naturellement, l'impact des, des images en temps de guerre est beaucoup plus important, en tout cas pour les Palestiniens, que, que, le, que le, 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 la force militaire des Israéliens eux-mêmes. Donc, il y a cette faute de France 2, me semble-t-il, de, de ne pas avoir pris conscience du fait qu'elle qu avait cautionné euh, une image grave, une image qui, qui, naturellement, en France même, a eu des répercussions, car les, les communautés musulmanes et juives en France sont également très importantes. Nous avons 6 millions de musulmans, 600 000 juifs, donc tout ça, tout ça a fait qu'également, s'il y a eu un impact au sein même de, au sein même de, 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 de la communauté française, avec une montée d'antisémitisme dans ces années-là, en 2000, qui a été causé notamment par cette affaire-là. Donc, ce n'est pas, pas une affaire banale. Et donc, il, il est tout à fait légitime de, de demander des comptes et d'avoir de, des vérités. Or, euh, je, je remarque à ce point de, 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 de l'histoire que les médias qui auraient dû être euh, l'occasion précisément de montrer qu'ils étaient un lieu de débat, un lieu de, de confrontation d'idées, et, et bien se sont, euh, se sont coalisés, vraiment coalisés, pour empêcher euh, que cette affaire ne soit, ne soit exprimée autrement que par des passions aujourd'hui dont on ne comprend plus rien. Et vous avez eu l'année dernière dans le Nouvel Observateur, qui est un hebdomadaire de gauche, une, une pétition qui rassemblait tous les, les plus éminents des journalistes et des grands reporters français, qui tous ont signé un... Pardon 
mais qui tous ont signé une pétition de soutien à Charles Anderlin en ne voulant même pas entendre les, les éléments de, de, de constitutifs d'une interrogation sur ce qui aurait pu se passer. Et donc ce corporatisme de la presse euh, a été d'abord m'a affligé et non, naturellement et, 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 de manière incroyable et pose, et pose ce problème aujourd'hui de savoir si la presse ou non est crédible, de savoir si oui ou non la presse euh, peut, peut, doit accepter ou pas accepter de voir ses, parfois ses, 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 euh, ses, ses, la relation de ces faits euh, remis en cause par, par, par des gens qui ne sont pas obligatoirement journalistes. Et moi je trouve que ce débat qui est aujourd'hui posé, de savoir que la, la presse doit avoir, doit avoir à rendre des comptes, et peu importe le fait que ce soit dérangeant ou pas, est intéressant. Et quand j'entends, j'en finis, si j'ai mon il faut que j'aille vite, si, quand j'en finis, si euh, quand on, on vous entend maintenant comme argument que le fait que Carsanti avance ces, ces, ces éléments, mais que euh, sa démarche est, est d'abord politique, et en fait qu'on laisse entendre que sa démarche est politique parce qu'il est juif, et qu'on laisse entendre que sa démarche est politique parce qu'il est sioniste, et qu'on laisse entendre qu'en fait ce, ce procédé reviendrait à un procédé ré révisionniste, parce que c'est ce que l'on entend également aujourd'hui, je trouve qu'on tombe là du coup dans une sorte de, de malhonnêteté qui, qui empêche d'aborder, enfin de, de vouloir saisir au plus près ce qui pourrait être la vérité. Et donc, je, je réitère mon, mon propos pour une demande de, de commission d'enquête sur cette affaire. Yvan, uh, uh, merci beaucoup. Um, Yvan a mentionné la débat de la table. Nous avons eu une heure de débat de notre panel. Vous avez vu la vidéo. And, uh, I'd like to get some questions from all of you for them on, uh, on exactly what you take from this particular case. And can I ask you when you do uh, speak, I think we've got some microphones for people asking questions. Uh, yeah. Can I answer now? You want to answer? Yeah, I, I think I'd like, in the course of uh, if, if we if we can have in the course of um, the questions, I'm sure, Philippe, you won't be excluded from from questions from the audience. Uh, but I do want to bring the audience in here, and if you can say where you're from before you uh, put your question and who you are, it always helps to give us a little bit of context. So can I get an idea of who would like to ask? some questions just to give me a sense of where to go and uh, who we can take. Okay. Um, we've got a lady at the back there. Okay. With a um, may I say the question in English or in Italian? As you prefer. I, I only understand uh, English, but uh, you can do both <laughs> if you like. I don't know how it's better for the translators. Whatever. Uh, anyway, I'm Laura Conti from School of Journalism of Naples. And uh, more than talking about uh, the case of Mohamed uh, Aldura, I'd like to talk about what uh, you and uh, Hugo Tramballi uh, underlined. So the case that in uh, war, it's really, really hard to report. I know that was the, uh, the topic of yesterday, but especially this case um, bring uh, the evidence that uh, in war, even a reporter becomes a soldier, we can say, and that the matter is, and it was underlined more times, that uh, the uh, cameraman was uh, uh, basically Palestinian, and that's one of, of the biggest problem of reporting in the Middle East, the fact that most of the media ask uh, Palestinians uh, to take footages, to, I mean, to give the video contribution, and really, really, uh, it's really, really seldom they uh, send reporters, as uh, Trambadi said, Even um, for two reasons, it's impossible to come inside the Gaza Strip, for instance, or um, they okay, don't... Let me put that to the, to the panel, yeah? Yeah, your, I'm your, sorry. Point, your question is essentially uh, on the employment of people who are participants in, in conflict zones, and, and what are the issues around that? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, okay. I'm going to summarize. I'm, my, question is, my, my question is just uh, this. Do you think... The, the question is for you and Mr. Tambali. Do you think it will be uh, more fair for, the journal, for journalists to create a team that can cover, uh, an international team, I mean, with uh, all the members that can cover these events? 
in order to let them be more, uh, I don't know, reliable, I mean, more trustable? That's the question. Thank you. Okay, well, as I'm sitting in the chair, I'm trying to uh, avoid passing too many of my opinions on, but I would say, ordinarily, journalists scrutinize one another's work. Uh, not always for the best reasons, mostly to try and trip one another up and to uh, uh, destroy each other's reputations. But uh, there is a lot in television uh, news of people uh, keeping one another honest, if you like. And uh, I've seen it happen on a several occasions where because different people work together, uh, the nature of television being as it is, uh, you you have the effect of not wanting to have your integrity compromised by perhaps somebody else who is a little more flexible with the truth, shall we say. So, uh, you know, that acts as a useful barrier. It's a little bit different where people work very closely together over a long period because A, they build up trust and a relationship and B, uh, that scrutiny doesn't necessarily work as effectively. That's simply my experience from television news. But uh, Uga, what, what, is, what do you make of, of the issue of using people as fixers, translators, drivers, helpers in war zones where they might have family, friends, personal commitments? How does one as a journalist balance that and, and if you like, take it into account when you're reporting? Mm, again, in Italian. Um, da tutte le volte, soprattutto che muore un giornalista, eh, si comincia a discutere su il giornalista deve essere protetto, il giornalista deve avere diritto accesso alla, alle notizie, ma ritorno su quello che ho detto prima, stiamo parlando di guerra, la guerra è una tragedia e i protagonisti di quella tragedia sono in genere dei ventenni che da una parte e dall'altra combattono, combattono credendo in quella cosa, per cui sono anche pronti a morire, giusta o sbagliata che sia, e noi ci presentiamo bel belli perché noi abbiamo il dovere di informare come dei sacerdoti al di sopra di tutto e di tutti e pretendiamo di essere garantiti nella sicurezza, di avere tutto, di avere praticamente come allo stadio una tribuna stampa sul campo di battaglia. Non è possibile, non è possibile che la nostra vita sia preservata, non è possibile che noi possiamo avere degli accessi privilegiati su un campo di battaglia che è una grande tragedia. Mm, e, non è, e in fondo alla fine non è possibile nemmeno... Ehm, nemmeno che ci siano non so, legami religiosi o familiari del conflitto che, stai, che come giornalista stai seguendo, che ci siano questi o meno, comunque tu sei coinvolto umanamente, perché appunto è una tragedia umana. Per questo, come dicevo anche forse ieri, non è, secondo me non esiste l'imparzialità, l'oggettività, per questo sono qui, perché anche lui è qui, non voglio discutere sulle sue motivazioni, però è qui per motivazioni politiche, eh, umane, personali, eh, mh, affettive e quindi tutti quanti noi in qualche modo lo siamo. In parole poi faccio un breve esempio e poi chiudo. Se io sono a Gerusalemme e è eh, un esempio che faccio spesso quando vado, partecipo ai dibattiti, so, se non vado a Gerusalemme e vedo l'auto numero 18 in Jaffa Road esploso, saltato per aria perché un kamikaze si è fatto esplodere e vedo corpi, braccia, teste di donne, bambini, civili israeliani, io non posso essere oggettivo. Sono umanamente come voi mh, un giornalista che vede e, no, e fatica adesso, e rivendico il mio diritto di non essere in quel momento. Se poi vado a Calandia e vedo per due ore come i soldati israeliani trattano le donne che, che vogliono andare all'ospedale, donne palestinesi che vogliono andare all'ospedale, i ragazzini che vogliono andare a scuola, gli uomini che vogliono andare al lavoro, non posso essere in quel momento oggettivo. Io credo che questa oggettività che viene rivendicata da chi poi ci presenta un, a un'agenda politica non è non sia possibile, certamente l'onestà è quella anche di spiegare le posizioni, di spiegare anche la sua posizione, di spiegare anche che forse magari Mohammed al è stato ucciso dal fuoco amico anziché dal fuoco israeliano, ma sostanzialmente non esiste questa oggettività, non esiste l'oggettività assoluta, soprattutto non esiste l'oggettività se vai al congresso della democrazia cristiana, non esiste l'oggettività se vai al fronte. Okay, can I have a few more hands up? Um, gentleman there, and can you just say who you are and who your question Thank you. is for? Um, Alexandre Sagdebaum, I'm in French, and I'm not a journalist. I'm sorry, I apologize for that. <laughs> okay, I'm just a scientist. 
I must say that um, when I have seen these images on the TV, like probably many of you, I was really shocked and was, was really impressed by the death of a child. Really, this is something which is, for every one of us, something which is a real drama. And uh, so this is something which was really a, a shock in that, in that time. But now we should really focus on the events and on what happened. And we should not say that we, sh we, we are checking the reality. We should not be uh, engaged and we should not consider the reality from a political point of view. We should leave the politics out and we should really stick to the fact. Someone, if the, if the boy has been killed, he has been killed by someone and we should know, it is important to know whether what, what uh, France 2 says was right or not. And I have to, after this shock, after a few days, I have looked at the, just at the map of the event, and the Israelis, every can, everyone can see it, um, the Israelis were far away, and they could not reach the child. They probably didn't even see the child. So this is just a fact, and we should stick to the fact and not make policy around the events. So I am really looking forward to what uh, uh, the, the film which Philippe Carcinetti could show. And uh, I thought it was going to be shown tonight. Uh, I don't understand why it's not uh, shown tonight. Just to explain why it's not being shown tonight, it's a debate and we didn't want to turn it into an individual presentation because it wouldn't be much of a debate if it was uh, one individual uh, giving their, uh, their show, if you like. Philippe's here as an important contributor and, and uh, he's here as an equal panelist with everyone else here. So that's uh, that to answer your question and I, I'm sure if you heard the advertisement you'll be here tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock to, to see his presentation. Um, Philippe, do you want to respond to a couple yeah. of those points? Yeah, well, I would like to, uh, to answer first Philippe Serious. So first, I'm not having a campaign. I'm just looking for the truth in this case. Uh, as they said, that's true. The IDF apologized when the boy was killed, as they said. And they said, we did it. And then after two months later, they said, well, it's probably not us who did uh, the, the killing. And no. then after... Philippe, can I just stop you for a moment and say... Uh, you've just said you're interested in the truth in this case. Now, the point's been made from the, f from the audience that, uh, you know, okay. you're, you're, if you like, party pre, that you are... You no, no, yeah, I'd like to enter in, but I'm, it's, it's on, on the list of the things. I'm just okay. entering the, the points. So, and now, in 2007, the Israeli army said, no, we did not kill, he was not killed, it was most probably a stage hoax. It's an official letter of the IDF. Um, so, um, I'd like to come to other question. When Viseria said it's not possible to question our good faith or our credibility, of course, as, and as a citizen, it's a complete ridiculous statement. Uh, when, yes, of course, we are under a Supreme Court uh, verdict now in France, but it doesn't prevent them from, from having a debate. The main problem for them is that exactly, you know, we don't want to look at that. Those guys receive 15 bullets, they don't bleed, there is no blood nowhere, but we're not going to argue this because they don't want to argue with the facts because they know that if we go to the facts, they are ridiculous. It's what happened at the court. Everybody laughed at the court. Even the judge were laughing at the end. It was so ridiculous. So he said, Philip de Seria said that they were willing to bring the father to have him examined. Bring him. You're free to come. I mean, take the father, take him to the Roma hospital, Paris hospital, take medical doctors, and you'll see that the scars that he's showing are just scars of knives and axes, because he's been assaulted with knives and axes eight years before the event, and they put bandages around, this, um, around those former scars. So this is about Philippe de Serias. Now I'd like to answer uh, Hugo. Uh, first, I was shocked by what I heard. I said, I heard that he came here with, for solidarity with colleagues um, about conspiracy. I'm telling you, Journalism is not a question of corporatism. Journalism is a question about facts. And coming here for solidarity and just arguing, I mean, I think that you lost your whole credibility for your, your whole career by just saying, I'm here because as a solidarity journalist, I mean, it's ridiculous. You claim that you saw people dying, receiving, receiving bullets. 
They were not bleeding. I mean, it's just obnoxious for me to hear this kind of statement. So now we come to my political agenda. Yes, I'm Jewish. Charles Anderlin, the guy who made this, is more Jewish than I am because he is French and Israeli. I'm only French. I'm a French citizen. I'm a French elected citizen. And yes, yes, I have a political agenda. I'm elected. I'm deputy mayor of Neuilly, the city where Sarkozy was the mayor. I run against Sarkozy at the parliament seven years ago. I lost, as you may imagine. Okay. But yes, I have a political agenda. I think we have ideas as, as every citizen. I'm involved in politics, but I'm just a French citizen. I don't speak Hebrew. It's I'm a French, okay? Um, I'd like to, um, okay, well, so promote a code or an image. No, I'm sticking to the fact. Everybody try, someone tries, every time someone tries to take me out of this, what about the Gaza and the killing in Gaza last month, two months ago? It's not my point. I'm telling you, this news report is a stage hoax, a complete stage hoax. So uh, I'm almost over. Um, yes, uh, so yeah, so the, the mistake that Anderlin did by accepting this news report, by editing it and broadcasting all over the world, you have to remember that there was a man, Mike Hanna, who is not a Jew, he's a Lebanese, from Lebanese origin, if we had to go to those kind of things, I mean, it was like 70 years ago that you have to say Jewish, Christian, but now, I mean, it, it seems that we have to go to those religions. So, yes, Mike Hanna, who's a Christian, Lebanese, working for CNN, received the same raw material and he refused to broadcast it because he said it is not authentic. And don't tell me that Mike Hanna is an extreme Zionist. As, I, as we told before, he's working for Al Jazeera International, but he's not a crazy extreme. And I'm going to finish, okay? I'd like to address to those who uploaded very much Viserius and Ugo and say, please come and see the details. Try to contradict me. I'm really willing to have to listen to your contradictions on the details. If you succeed, I'll apologize. I'll offer dinner to the whole room, and uh, I'm serious, I'm serious. And, okay, I'll offer dinner to the whole room, so come for a free dinner if you want. And remember, 15 bullets, no blood, no injury, and see you tomorrow. Philippe, if I can just put the questions from, uh, if I can get back to you briefly on, on uh, and very briefly on, the issue of a political agenda. I think uh, people accept, uh, some people accept, and I would be one of them, that you've raised some very important points about Charles Wonderland's report, and uh, you've raised doubts about aspects of that report. I think where people uh, are concerned, perhaps, about the agenda and the use of, of, of uh, the interest in this particular case is that I think many of us would agree that facts are very important, that fakery doesn't have a place in, in television journalism and, and the news. But we would like to see uh, someone seeking after truth applying that uh, forensic skill to all of the reporting coming out of conflict areas or perhaps just that part of the Middle East rather than simply one story and I think the your concentration on one story is what people are, are talking about when they're asking you about your politics i.e. why aren't you applying these very detailed and very forensic techniques to all of the reporting coming out from all the different sides so let me answer you this first you have to understand that before this I built a company which name is media ratings and we were investigating on, on all the media inaccuracies. We're discussing all economics, politics, foreign policy, anything, and we're criticizing the media. It happened that we had lawsuits by friends too, and at a certain point I had to stop to do anything else. I'm just traveling, I've been gathering more evidence, and it has, been, it has taken most of my time just to, to, to prove the evidence. As I told you, I'm not a journalist. This, what I did here, should have been done by some journalists, investigative journalists. And I'm telling you something. Remember the ARD, Public German TV, broadcast a month ago a documentary which accused France 2 of having broadcast a fake news report. What was the reaction of France 2? Patrick de Caroli sent a letter of threat to, to ARD and they say, if you don't send us a letter of excuse, we will sue you and we will break all the relationships between the public TV, German public TV, and the French public TV. And ARD answered, okay, sue us, break whatever you want. So this is only intimidation. Three days ago I was in Paris, I had to have a press conference. You know what they did? They called the place where I was supposed to have my press conference to put pressure and to have the press conference 
cancelled and the press conference was cancelled. They are afraid to see me showing. So my strategy is to go all over the world. I'm here. I'm going to be in India in a few months. I'm in America in all the universities. I've been to all the schools of, of uh, journalism in America. And I'm telling you something, all of them. And I've had in the room people from all the origins. And everybody agrees at the end of the presentation, it's a complete full staged hope. And never forget that the justice, the French, and I'm finishing this, with this sentence, the French justice allows me to say, to publish, and to claim on radio and to write articles saying that, that France 2 broadcast a fake news report, a masquerade which discredits France 2 and its public TV, and it's full of staged scenes. That's it. Thank you. Lily, before you have to buy dinner for everybody, I want to uh, get some more people in. And if I can, can we have uh, two or three people and just make a point and we'll try and get your questions across the panel because I'm also why well, we haven't had a chance to get uh, Yvonne in so much. So, okay. gentlemen, oh, who's, got the, who's got the microphone? Can they do? Okay. Ah, lady there. Eh, Ronda Gazzi, Italia, eh, studentessa, scrittrice. Eh, volevo fare solo una domanda molto veloce. Eh, ammettendo che, pur ammettendo che le immagini riferite a Mohammed Aldora siano false, eh, è inevitabile ed è chiarissimo che ci sia molto indottrinamento e propaganda sia da parte israeliana che da parte palestinese e araba in generale, ma non trovo assurdo stare a disquisire sulla eh, morte vera o fittizia di un ragazzino quando oggi nel presente c'è stato un attacco come quello di Gaza dove per punire un partito sono stati uccisi centinaia e centinaia di civili e dove Israele non ha concesso, e dove Israele non ha concesso ai giornalisti Così come a Genino. Stavo chiedendo se non sembrava assurdo eh, perdere tempo e disquisire sulla morte vera o fittizia di un bambino eh, quando oggi, nel presente, non otto anni fa, ma oggi, eh, a Gaza c'è stato un attacco in cui per punire un partito sono stati uccisi centinaia e centinaia di civili e in cui Israele non ha ammesso ai giornalisti stranieri di entrare, così come a Jenin o in altri casi. Come si, la posizione di Israele è indifendibile perché se non concede ai giornalisti stranieri di entrare a documentare quello che succede, è inevitabile che poi la propaganda araba possa prevalere sul resto. Okay. Uh, can I just say uh, when we do, let's, let's have questions people can answer rather than speeches they can applaud because uh, we can do speeches later on but, but questions are what the guys on the panel are here to answer for you. Yeah, uh, it's Albert, I'm the director of uh, Israeli NGO that uh, monitor the media, uh, the Israeli media and the former uh, correspondent of the Aaretz daily newspaper in Israel. Uh, in the occupied territories uh, during the first intifada. Uh, one short remark and one short question to Mr. Karasanti. Uh, it's not true that Israel blame uh, the Palestinian or, or uh, France do uh, by doing uh, manipulation or something fake uh, story. The formal, the current formal uh, position of State of Israel and uh, it uh, simply uh, can be checked by even through the internet the, the, the position of the army, Israeli army, and the foreign, foreign uh, 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 ministry is that Israel has no uh, position about the facts. Uh, Israel not blame, not the Palestinians and not uh, France do, and not say this is uh, Israeli responsibility or Palestinian responsibility. Uh, this is the rem remark, and my question is, if uh, uh, Mr. Karasanti accepts the analysis of, of the pictures, if you made any fieldwork or if you have any testimonies, eyewitnesses and other evidence about this uh, issue. Thanks for that. Um, can we just get some more Sorry, points in? Sorry, did you get the end of the question? Yeah, you, did you do any witness interviews? And we'll get back to you. Lady there. Well, I'm Antonia. I'm a Spanish journalist um, at university. I am working about war propaganda. So my, my reflection is, well, is so similar to her reflection. Uh, I don't know if a... a question, though. No, yes, but one more. I don't know if a journalist uh, can be or not objective, but I know uh, a journalist has to be honest. So. I want to be honest with you. I'm, I'm support the Palestinian cause. I think it's a fair, um, you, you know, I, I think 
the, they are right. And what I want to say is the same that, that her, if, I don't know if the, the video is false or not. I, may, I thought it is false, but that's not the point. The point is the situation in Gaza, so is that. Um, I don't want to defend going over history. I have to say, um, you know, this is, we're talking about this case because it was profoundly uh, impactful at the time. And I know in the festival we've also talked about Gaza. So, you know, this is only nine years ago. And for those of us as old as me, uh, that doesn't seem very long ago. I'm sorry for the younger people here who think that's a lifetime uh, ago. But it is still something which... Uh, is live and controversial and about which a court case is currently going on in France. So that is why we're talking about it and we're not talking about it to ignore uh, what's currently happening, but it does raise questions of itself. So just to raise that point from the, from the chair, can we just get a couple more points in before? Can we get a couple more points in from people who want to? Yeah, gentleman at the front who raised his. Hello. Hi. Have we, have we got a... Um, hi, I... You're not the gentleman at the front, are you? You're the lady in the middle. Okay, um, I just had a question about um, co correspondents working in war zones, um, especially with the, the, the ban on journalists um, at, during the Gaza war, but also in Baghdad in the Green Zone where it was very hard for Western journalists especially to, to leave, um, and they had to rely on stringers what, what do the panelists think um, as a professional journalist? Is it, is it better? Sometimes you have to rely on Stringer's video or reports without having seen it yourself. And isn't it better to, to rely on those rather than not report at all? Thank you for that. And can we get the, the mic to the gentleman at the front? He's had his hand up originally. So. No, solo una piccola considerazione. Per, per ristabilire la verità dei fatti. Io sono un giornalista, faccio anch'io l'inviato di guerra, sto lavorando su questo caso da diversi mesi. Io dico e chiedo anche a voi, non ha alcun senso, cioè sta passando in secondo piano il video e si dice non è importante che sia vero o falso. Allora, possiamo permetterci di aprire il giornale domani dicendo ah, questa è l'apertura del Corriere, sarà vera? o è falsa? Io guardo il Tg1 e mi posso porre il problema se il primo, la prima notizia del Tg1 è vera o falsa. No, il problema va risolto, bisogna entrare uh, all'interno uh, del dibattito che Filippo chiede. Io ho avuto modo di parlare diverse volte con Filippo, ho fatto diverse interviste. Cominciamo col dire, Tramballi prima lo poneva il problema, Dobbiamo essere qui in 200 a parlare se ci sono state le torri gemelle oppure no? Se c'è, cioè, dar ragione a Thierry Meissan oppure no? No, non ha senso fare un, dubato, un dibattito sulla teoria cospirativa sull'11 settembre. Le torri sono crollate, lo sappiamo tutti, anche se non c'è la prova del famoso terzo aereo sul Pentagono. Se vogliamo stare qui a discutere e a fare dietrologie però non ha, non ha senso, siamo giornalisti o no? Verità dei fatti, allora. C'è una serie di cose, caro Filippo, che hai detto che sono vistosamente false. E co occorre ristabilirla la verità. Allora, Mike Hanna, il producer di CNN che tu hai citato e che ha ricevuto le immagini quel giorno lì assieme a France 2, non le ha mandate in onda perché CNN... Quel giorno, 30 settembre, cioè il giorno dopo la famosa passeggiata di Sharon sulla spianata delle moschee, che ha dato inizio all'intifada, perché l'intifada non è partita per colpa di questo reportage di France 2. L'intifada è partita perché Sharon ha avuto la sciagurata idea di provocare i palestinesi il 29 settembre del 2000. Il giorno dopo si sapeva che ci sarebbero stati degli scontri. Il cameraman di France 2, Talal Abourakma, che è un giornalista professionista, ragazzi, non è un tecnico. Talal è un giornalista professionista, con tanto di tesserino, che quindi, come me e come gli altri che sono qui, ha la capacità e dovrebbe avere la correttezza di valutare le informazioni. Quindi io uh, faccio fiducia a Talal, tant'è che Talal Abourakma 
ha lavorato durante la guerra di Gaza, questa ultima guerra, ha lavorato come producer della CNN. Siamo qui a discutere di, di, di un cameraman che se ha lavorato adesso per la CNN, vuol dire che la CNN gli fa fiducia, gli dà fiducia. Quella volta lì la CNN, la CNN ha deciso di non mandare in onda le immagini di France 2 perché non voleva esacerbare gli animi, perché comunque, così come Anderlein ha fatto quel giorno, ha chiesto allo Stato Maggiore israeliano che dite voi di questa vicenda e lo Stato Maggiore israeliano ha risposto ci scusiamo, è stato un errore, è vero che poi nei giorni a venire e nei mesi a venire le, ehm, le opinioni sono cambiate. Altri elementi, attenzione, non stiamo parlando di, di carta stampata, nella carta stampata sono in gioco solo alcune cose. Uh, no, uh, yeah, nella carta stampata si discute del, degli errori di ortografia che ci sono oppure no. Anche nel giornalismo televisivo esiste una grammatica, esiste un'ortografia. Ad esempio, quando Philippe dice che dopo la morte presunta, come dice lui, del piccolo Mohammed, i due spariscono, non sono più dietro il barile, per cui lascia intendere che i due attori sono andati via. Lì c'è un cut, c'è uno stop. Quando il cameraman stoppa l'immagine, poi la riprende, magari dopo 12 anni, dopo 3 minuti, dopo 6 ore, dipende da quanto tempo passa, quindi non c'è una continuità temporale all'interno del girato, dei rushes di un cameraman. Quando non si vede il sangue su una... cioè qui non siamo a CSI, dove si vede il sangue dappertutto. Questa è la realtà che viene filmata. Quindi se uno, se uno zoom all'interno del filmato... Oh, ok, I think, to be honest, if I can, if I can say... No, I'm going to have to say to you, you need to get up early in the morning and tell him that tomorrow, ok? Because you've really okay. chosen the wrong place to, uh, to give... Uh, the speech, and I think that gentleman's already spoken, so can we just no. hear from somebody ten who seconds? hasn't? No. Ten, ten, ten <laughs> can, we, can we pass the phone ten, to someone who hasn't ten, spoken? Just ten seconds. No, do you, do you mind? Because yeah. this is about giving people an opportunity yeah. to speak. That just, gentleman's just had a huge I opportunity. Just, I just want to say that no, no. I've been shocked by what I have yeah. heard, because uh, if, if, can can, if some people can to say to that the facts have no importance, then they are paving the way to a uh, fascistic or totalitarian society. Well, in this, in this particular hall, I'm afraid... Uh, the question is very important whether facts are true or not. Can we have uh, the gentleman just over there? In? And then we'll... Can we have the gentleman over there with his hand up? I'm very old-fashioned, and I think if you put your hand up, you deserve a... Can we give it to the gentleman with his hand up? Thanks. Sorry. This is where I have to be very boring in English and be... You know, my job is a little bit like the referee in football. Everyone is supposed to hate me. Grazie. Uh, scusate, io, io sono Chiara, dimmi tanto. Io sono Chiara... Per... No, you're not a gentleman either, are you? <laughs> I know that. Io, uh, scusate, non ho capito uh, cosa però lo ha portato a sposare questa causa. Uh, lei diceva che aveva una, una società che osservava i media, uh, poi però ha fatto di questa... Anch'io ho visto il filmato e non mi è venuto da andare a indagare la traiettoria dei proiettili, eccetera. Evidentemente lei ha studiato questa cosa a fondo, ha sposato questa causa e ha detto che adesso la porta in giro per il mondo presentando i risultati della sua ricerca. Mi chiedo anche, siccome andare in giro per il mondo comunque costa, uh, mi chiedo come si finanzia e comunque cosa la spinta I like that it's a question and just because I keep saying oh it's his question that's even better ok we're going to take a little pause there because we've got about four or five different questions and uh, I think if I can break them down into uh, briefly uh, field work and trusting uh, local stringers in the field I do want people to answer that question uh, The issue of the authenticity of, of the material itself, um, which I think Philippe can address, and uh, I, because he hasn't had a chance to contribute, I'm going to just get Ivan in to uh, talk about uh, the issue of the veracity or non-veracity of 
the material. I don't know, uh, are you able to understand me with, the, with that, with your earphones? Yeah? Yeah, you're okay. So we've, you know, we've taken the very academic, uh, perhaps, position of saying, perhaps it's true, perhaps it isn't, uh, but it raises questions. What about the issue from the gentleman at the front who says, it's true or it isn't true? What, what do you say to that kind of uh, that position, Ivan? Oui, euh, je voudrais aussi revenir, si vous me le permettez, quand même au thème du débat, parce qu'on parle beaucoup de l'affaire Aldoura, mais le thème du débat, c'était faut-il faire confiance ou faut-il croire aux médias C'était quand même ça ce qui nous a ce qui nous a amené ici à en débattre. Donc je ne voudrais pas non plus qu'on qu passe notre temps à parler de l'affaire Aldoura, mais l'affaire Aldoura est très révélatrice de ce qu'est le mal des, des médias, le mal de la presse aujourd'hui. Donc ça peut, ça peut naturellement l'illustrer, mais ce serait peut-être bien si on pouvait tout de même l'élargir ensuite. Car ce que l'on entend euh, depuis, depuis quelque temps... Ce que l'on entend depuis quelque temps est tout à fait accablant. On entend euh, d'un côté un confrère euh, plutôt militant qui, nous, qui fait l'apologie du militantisme et du journalisme d'émotion. Je n'ai rien contre, mais enfin, effectivement, ce n'est pas, ce, pas le, 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 ce qui est le plus objectif dans l'appréciation la, la, des faits. On entend euh, de, 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 une, une apologie de l'idéologie qui est effectivement très commune dans le journalisme, mais qui est également en contradiction avec les faits. On entend du, du corporatisme en face, du suivisme, du nombrilisme, mais on oublie euh, le, ce qui a été très bien imposé par, par monsieur, de savoir de quoi l'on parle. Est-ce que l'on parle des faits ou est-ce que l'on parle de, des suspicions idéologiques des uns, des procès des autres, etc. Et je me rends compte que la, la, et la crise du journalisme que traverse le journalisme en France, en tout cas je ne connais moins la, la, la position du journalisme en Italie, et la crise du journalisme en France est précisément une crise d'idéologie, c'est-à-dire que le journalisme en France aujourd'hui est incapable de se confronter aux faits. Et c'est de cela aussi dont il faudrait parler, car il faut se, faut se demander pourquoi. Et dans l'affaire Aldoura, qui est un bon exemple, c'est quand même ahurissant de voir qu'en neuf ans, en neuf en neuf ans d'affaires, vous avez parlé qu'il y a eu un, beaucoup de débats en France euh, sur cette affaire-là, c'est faux. Il y a eu une omerta sur cette affaire, il y a eu des polémiques à l'accessoire, mais le fond du débat n'a jamais été abordé, comme le fond du débat n'a pas été abordé non plus sur d'autres sujets de société beaucoup plus importants que cette affaire Aldoura. Euh, on, nous vivons des bouleversements euh, sociétaux, sociologiques, éducatifs euh, extraordinaires comme jamais la société française n'en a connu. Or, vous vous apercevez que les médias français aujourd'hui euh, vous parlent de pipo de Carla Bruni, de, de, de Ségolène Royal, font des unes sur, des, sur ces femmes-là, ou font des, des pseudo-journalismes d'investigation en, en allant chercher leurs informations chez, chez un ancien directeur des renseignements généraux dont il a été prouvé que les informations qu'il donnait à la presse étaient des tuyaux crevés. Et donc il y a, il y a aussi ce, ce vrai problème qui, moi, me préoccupe encore plus que l'affaire Aldoura, encore une fois, de savoir à quoi sert la presse aujourd'hui et si, oui ou non, la presse va se rendre compte qu'elle est comme ces mandarins dans, dans, la, dans leur cité interdite et qu'elle ne se regarde aujourd'hui le nombril et qu'elle ne supporte pas d'être remise en question. Et cette affaire Aldoura montre bien effectivement à quel point la presse ne supporte pas d'être remise en question. Merci. Thanks, Ivan. And uh, thanks, Ivan. And uh, Philippe, can I uh, ask you to address a couple okay. of questions from the floor? Firstly, on the issue of uh, uh, a lady who said, uh, you know, who's supporting you in your okay. uh, I want to start campaign, with and and also uh, the gentleman there who says, you know, okay. you have to. Uh, except there's one interpretation of, of what's going on here and, and yours is, is not true. Okay, so yes, you're right. Those trials are very expensive. As I said before, I'm a businessman before everything. I used to be a stockbroker before the market collapsed. So I had the chance to make money before. Uh, I'm still a little bit in mergers and acquisitions, but most of the time I'm about this case. And uh, that's okay. I mean, I, ha I had enough uh, money before. Uh, sometimes when I go to America, I sell my lectures to some think tanks and some institutions, and that's it. So this is about the money. About why, and I'm sorry the woman asked me a question before, but she left. Uh, well, why to focus on this picture? This is the most important picture in terms of media that we've seen go all over the world. I mean, Daniel Pearl has been killed to avenge this image. 
uh, in any Arabic or Muslim country, you have a street Muhammad al -Dura, you have stamps, you have buildings Muhammad al -Dura, you have everything. So it's, it's a huge image and knowing that this huge image, which is really inflaming, which inflames the Muslim world, it's a, it was a year before 9-11. It was really at the beginning of the Intifada. It inflamed the, the brains and I think it's very important in order to make peace, peace one day, I'm asking, you know what, you're, you're asking me a political not question, not I will not, not answer this because this is not my, I mean, you know you're going into politics, and I'm sorry, if you want to go into politics, go on the left. I'm telling you something, I, but this I, is not, I'm, 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 I'm Philip, sorry. Can I stop you there for a moment? No, but I'm, I'd just like to answer something. Can I stop you there for a moment by pressing that button and say uh, uh, you've done, a, you've done a, a good job in explaining your background and actually you're very lucky you're a stockbroker who hasn't been booed during the financial crisis. Uh, so the point uh, about Gaza I think uh, is an interesting point because and I'd like Ugo just to come in on that because uh, there is a sense when you look back over things that have become controversial in the past, even the recent past for people uh, as old as, uh, as me and perhaps even as, uh, uh, a little bit older like Ugo, of having to defend why we discuss them and why we still think they're relevant. And um, Ugo, you mentioned the politics and the background of it. I mean, can you perhaps explain why it's still an important uh, issue and, and, and what it's, you know, why should we just concentrate on the present and to the exclusion of, of reporting in the last nine years? Well, I don't mind. I mean, it's true. We have to. We can too. We, we, we can try to find out the, 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 the truth regarding uh, the Mohad al Dua. I mean, it's not bad. It's always useful to find out the truth. Uh, my point is but we need to know that it's, a, it's a politically motivated. Then we can find it out, of course. We can find out the, the reason why he has been killed, who killed him, the reason why he has been killed a lot of other people, both Israelis or Palestinians. Fine. Uh, I'm ready to be under, under scrutiny about my job. Fine. But, but my point is, but we need to know that it's a, it's a politically motivated. Then we can find it out, of course. We can find out the, the reason why he has been killed, who killed him, the reason why he has been killed a lot of other people, both Israelis or Palestinians. Fine. Uh, I'm ready to be under, under scrutiny about my job. Fine. But, but my point was only to, to, to underline to the young journalists here that he was politically motivated. Fine. Then he's got any right to. He clarified that. He said, I'm a politically motivated. Fine. So. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. But I'm sorry, you just. No, you're, you're, you're making it up. No, I'm telling you that you are politically motivated. I'm telling you, yes, I'm a French elected official, which is, doesn't have nothing to do, anything to do with sorry. the Middle East. Sorry, yeah. I'm elected yeah. in New York, the city yeah. of Sarkozy. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. And, I apologize. He's not politically motivated. For me, he is politically motivated. He, he didn't say that, but for me, he's politically motivated, and I believe that what he said showed that I believe a lot of people uh, in, this, in this room will, will agree with me that he's politically motivated. And I don't have anything against this point, but he's against this point. Fine. Again, but yeah, anyway, and, and I am coming, let, let me come back to the beginning of the question. Yes, it's, anyway, it's useful to find out uh, the, 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 the truth regarding Mohammed al -Dua. You're right. It's, we need to know. We need to know. It's useful to know. But I wonder how many cases his uh, society, his, uh, his, his organization, his, uh, his agency is studying on. I hope it, it will be a lot. Because his organization reminds me, you know, the, the, another organization, uh, Correct Information. In Italy we have Informazione Corretta. Uh, it's an a anti-defamation league organization uh, network and uh, it's, they just control correctly, they say, the, 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 the information we, we, we put on the, on the newspapers and the magazines and on the radio and TV. So it's the same kind of politically motivated job. They are, they are allowed to do that. They, it's their job. It's, they have the right to do it. Important is to, do, to be clear about the aim of everything. Thank you. Okay, I want to take a couple more points from the floor, and then I'm going to ask our panelists to... Uh, can I uh, my answer? Just, I had like three short questions I'd like to Can make. I just get the guys in from the floor and get you to answer that in your closing statement, Philippe? That would be great. Just because the people on the floor need a little bit of an opportunity to. So can I take the general, whoever's got the mic, the gentleman there, 
gentleman there and the chap at the back. Okay, or, or, yeah? Can we do that? Yeah. I, uh, yeah, we'll, start, we'll start at the back and work our way slowly forward. Okay. My question was for Mr. Carcenti, and I was just wondering if your company, Media Ratings, has found any instances of Israeli news media attempting to frame the conflict in terms beneficial to their cause with the conflict with Palestine. Okay. I'm going to ask Philippe to deal with that in his, in his upsum. Uh, gentleman in the white t-shirt. Uh, thank you, uh, Julian Assange uh, from WikiLeaks. We uh, specialise in leaking thousands of internal government secret documents every year. Um, from our perspective, it's extremely important to know uh, whether the material is true or not. Uh, and the reason being is that if there's doubt about some material, that doubt extends to all material. And it under, under uh, mind all journalism and all confidential sources and uh, candid uh, camera sources. So it's really important to establish uh, the veracity of, uh, of documents uh, or of videos. Um, otherwise, the vast majority of material, which is always true because the truth comes for free, it's part of a normal economic activity or a normal situation on the ground, producing fakes is uh, hard, complex and it's extra work. So the truth will always be the majority of what you see on TV, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, or uh, leaked documents that come out. Um, but this particular case or other cases which are doubted really need to be nailed down as to whether they're true or not uh, and concluded. And so I would urge, uh, well, Philippe is obviously taking one side, but I'd urge that other journalists conclude this case because it undermines everything else. Thanks for that, Julian. And uh, can I just get the gentleman at the front? And I'm always, always grateful to see laziness put forward as being one of the prime reasons for trusting journalism, but uh, I think Julian's got a good point. I have a question for Mr. Corsanti. My name is Lorenzo Camonese of Corriere della Sera. I've been about 20 years in Israel as a correspondent. And um, I have a very technical question to ask you about this video. We saw the few minutes, it's a very well-known video, we saw it many times on the TV, etc. Do you think that all the video is fake? I mean, we saw the contest, we saw the shooting in the Nazarim area, we saw the shooting at the ambulance. Actually, there is one guy who looks falling down in front of the ambulance, many people running, there, is a, uh, there are some doctors or par paramedics full of civilians shouting around. I mean, you think all this is faking? or only the, the Aldura, Aldura part? How is it built? Um, how does it work? Because I tell you, having been there such a long time, all the scene looks to me very credible. I saw, unfortunately, in my career, many dead bodies. In many cases, I didn't see blood. I was myself under fire many times. It looks to me very, very possible. Okay, now I'm going to say I don't want Philippe to answer that entirely because he's going to be doing a presentation at 9 o'clock and, and very well and he will do, be doing that later on. But I think can we, if we can sum up in broad terms some of those points, I think we'll, uh, we'll leave here before half past 11. Okay, uh, so half past 11 tomorrow? Tonight. 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 Um, is anyone finally, before I close down and get, get people to sum up, anyone want to uh, pitch in with a final thought? Sì, dunque, mi chiamo Alessandro Stanza dell'Agenzia di Informazione Amisnet. E, mh, una breve considerazione e poi la domanda. E, credo, dunque, in questo festival ci sono delle Lexio Magistralis. Sinceramente, assistendo a queste Lexio Magistralis, a volte onestamente ho avuto anche il dubbio se, se tali fossero. Però credo che indirettamente oggi abbiamo assistito a una, una Lexio Magistralis, no? non involontariamente. Cioè, di come... Eh, come dire, l'infiltrazione di una parte del, nel conflitto arrivi, arrivi anche ad un festival di giornalismo, perché questo, di questo si tratta, ovviamente è una mia opinione. 
E quindi la Lexio Valtistralis consiste proprio a, a tutti i giovani giornalisti che, che si, accingono, si accingono a fare questa, questo mestiere di stare sempre in guardia dalle, sulle fonti, perché sennò si potrebbe pensare che effettivamente è un'agenzia di, di controinformazione qualsiasi e che invece non sia finanziata vero, assai verosimilmente direttamente da, dallo Stato di Israele, questo, di questo si tratta. E, la, la domanda indirettamente io la rivolgo ai, ai, agli organizzatori, a nessuno de, degli interventi, cioè se noi dobbiamo prendere questo, questo uh, panel di oggi come una provocazione, personalmente ci sto e, e mi viene anche dello, cioè, so, lo so, sorrido e, e la prendo così, credo che però non sia perché domani c'è anche la presentazione il cui, cui dimostra un po' come dire, la, il dolo, diciamo, no? Se invece non si tratta di una provocazione mi chiedo eh, che senso abbia un, un dibattito del genere, però non credo ci siano degli organizzatori qui adesso in sala. Eh, la mia domanda la rivolgo a loro. Grazie. Oh, ok, well, uh, unfortunately they're not on the panel, but um, uh, I hope they weren't considering uh, inviting us uh, here as a, as a way of provoking you. Uh, more as a way of, uh, of engaging and, uh, and diverting you for a period of time. Posso? But, yeah. um, lady at the front. Eh, semplicemente, diciamo, mi ha anticipato di qualche minuto l'ultimo intervento. Eh, mi l'ho sentita come una provocazione. La, immaginavo, quando sono arrivata qua, di trovare qualcosa di completamente diverso, nel senso che il video servisse come spunto per poi lanciare eh, un vero dibattito sulla questione del, della credibilità dei mezzi di comunicazione e dei mass media. La domanda finale è possiamo credere a mass media? Quindi mi immaginavo anche un discorso riferito ai grandi poteri economici che ci sono nei mass media. Vorrei fare un parallelismo fra queste immagini che sono state mostrate e un grande caso eclatante che è stato quello del Venezuela, del colpo di Stato, in cui in tutta l'America Latina, in qualsiasi angolo dell'America Latina, non so dell'Europa perché io ero di là, eh, venivano mostrate le stesse immagini e argomentate con la stessa foga che ho sentito eh, oggi qui, e dicendo per esempio nel caso che, in quel caso particolare, che i militari chavisti stavano sparando contro la folla che in realtà stava facendo un colpo di Stato contro Chavez e voleva toglierlo dal governo, no? Dopo giorni e giorni in cui è stata ripetuta questa cosa e sono state mostrate quelle immagini semplicemente da un angolo diverso, si è venuto a sapere in realtà che il colpo di Stato era contro Chavez e soprattutto si è venuto a sapere il ruolo fondamentale che ha avuto il gruppo di Cisneros eh, all'interno del colpo di Stato. Il colpo di Stato è stato fondamentalmente un colpo di Stato mediatico, nel senso che l'unico canale, eh, canale di Stato che avrebbe potuto trasmettere quello che succedeva era il canale 8 e tutti gli altri canali invece, eh, a differenza di quello che succede in Italia, appartengono quasi ad un unico gruppo. Quindi io vorrei, non è tanto una domanda, vorrei ringraziare Ugo, Ugo Tramballi che ha fatto il primo intervento subito dopo Filippo, perché qui appunto si chiede possiamo credere ai media, io sinceramente penso di no, però penso che possiamo credere a giornalisti che ci danno un po' di sollievo quando parlano, come in questo caso. Grazie. Um, if I can go from Yvonne to Ugo and finish uh, with Philippe, who probably has more questions uh, to answer than, uh, than all of us, uh, then I think I'd also like to, to thank them because it's been a very difficult uh, panel to address and to bring together and uh, I hope it's given you an insight into uh, how these debates uh, unfold and sometimes I think you know in the microscopic discussion of, uh, of material you can see much wider issues and problems at least I hope you can and if you don't feel you've been able to then my apologies uh, from the chair but if I can just ask Ivan in the first case just to give his kind of upsumming thoughts on, on uh, what we've been talking about. Je crois que nous avons à résoudre, nous en tant que journalistes, un problème de confiance que l'on a maintenant vis-à-vis -vis de, enfin journalistes de presse écrite vis-à-vis -vis de, de nos lecteurs et peut-être journalistes des médias audiovisuels vis-à-vis -vis de leurs téléspectateurs. Si les gens n'achètent plus de journaux, 
c'est bien parce qu'ils ne se reconnaissent plus, ils ne reconnaissent plus la, la vie qu'ils vivent dans la, les comptes rendus des journaux. Donc euh, il faut, il faut ce, que les médias acceptent de se confronter à ce, à ce fait-là, à cette, à cette crise de confiance. Et il est intéressant de voir que c'est en Italie, euh, ici même, qu'un qu pro, qu des problèmes inabordables, mais il y en a beaucoup d'autres en France, ce problème de l'affaire Aldourin a été posé publiquement, et dans le fond, c'est déjà un premier élément qui montre bien d'ailleurs quel est le, tra, le, le trajet que doit, que doit encore poursuivre la, la presse française avant de se confronter à ses propres, à ses propres réalités. Je pense qu'il faut que, pour, pour résumer, je pense qu'il faut que la presse aujourd'hui accepte de se mettre en danger, accepte d'écouter accepte ses contradicteurs, même si ces contradicteurs ne sont pas journalistes, même si ces contradicteurs ne sont pas convaincants, s'ils ne sont pas convaincants, mais je pense que la presse doit sortir de, de son monde clos et doit accepter de, de faire partie, d'être au même niveau que ses lecteurs et surtout euh, doit, doit, doit accepter que de, de, de comprendre que ses lecteurs ne sont pas des, des imbéciles et qu'ils peuvent voir les manipulations, les propagandes et tout, ces, tout ces, ces, cette pesanteur idéologique qui, qui, qui fait qu'aujourd'hui vous avez toutes les bulles euh, éclatent euh, les unes après les autres, toutes ces bulles idéologiques, euh, euh, en, en commençant par l'ultralibéralisme, le pédagogisme, euh, etc. Et vous n'avez qu'une seule bulle qui demeure encore, c'est la bulle du journalisme qui ne veut pas, qui a, qui a peur des faits, on l'a encore vu aujourd'hui, car dès que l'on parle de vouloir simplement se confronter aux faits, ça effraye très bizarrement les journalistes, dont le, pourtant la mission essentielle est de rapporter ces faits-là. Et donc je pense qu'il y a une véritable révolution culturelle euh, dans notre profession à engager, et très vite, si l'on ne veut pas être débordé, et on l'est déjà dans le fond, par, par l'Internet, par, par les rumeurs et par, et par tout ce qui pourrait effectivement faire ensuite qu'on qu ne pourra plus euh, assumer notre rôle euh, d'élément essentiel d'une démocratie. Thank you very much. Hugo, can I turn to you and ask you for your concluding thoughts? Non, moi, je voudrais seulement m'excuser parce que c'est ma faute si j'ai pris, pris le débat qui devait être sur la, la question sur la crédibilité des journalistes. Je l'ai pris. Ah, ça. Euh, je, je continue en français. <rire> Euh, sur, la, sur la crédibilité des journalistes, et au contraire, il devait être un débat sur, le, sur, sur en effet, le, sur, la, sur la crédibilité des journalistes. C'est ma faute, mais je croyais qu'il était nécessaire de le faire. Merci. So, well, I'm going to answer very quickly to the questions. Hold on, can I just... Uh, one second. If you're able just to stay for the conclusion, that would be lovely. But um, if I can just ask Philippe to, to finish up. Okay. So, um, Isar, that's not true. The IDF sent a letter, an official letter, saying that they didn't kill the boy, that it was staged, and it was in 2707. And I have the official letter, and if you want to come tomorrow, you'll have my email. I'll be able to send you all the documents. So, uh, uh, contrary to what said uh, Amedeo Ricucci, Mike Hanna at CNN refused to broadcast the news report because he said, I don't have any guarantee that this is authentic. Um, so when uh, he said that the two, uh, he said that the so-called two actors left the scene, the cameraman of France 2 said that the people bled for 17 minutes, and he was changing his battery, which is why he couldn't film the evacuation of the ambulance. I mean, taking 17 minutes to change one's battery, I think it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, so you say, why embrace the case? Okay, well, it was about the expensiveness. Okay, I'm sorry to tell you, but what I heard from Hugo, and I heard about his name before, and I had he was a respected journalist here. I think it discredits completely all what you've been doing because saying that the facts for you are not important, but that you're not just motivated by a political agenda, is completely discrediting. Uh, media ratings, whatever. Media ratings has been um, scrutinized, uh, has scrutinized 200 cases before and revealed 200 lies in the media, especially uh, in the French media and sometimes in foreign media. Uh, yes, sometimes it happens that we criticize uh, as a French media when they were too supportive to Israel, for example, when they were supporting Sharon, when Sharon was becoming the best friend of Chirac, the media, which were very accusatory to, to, Chirac, uh, to, to Sharon, became so friendly to Sharon that we published an article which showed that it was ridiculous to change one's mind just to follow the, the line of Jacques Chirac. 
Um, I think the truth is important. Don't forget to come tomorrow at 9, and I would like to answer Lorenzo. And uh, yes, the first scene is a complete fake scene, and I can, I, look, I'm going to show it to you tomorrow, but I can just give you something. The ambulance comes in two seconds and a half. The guy, which is unbelievable, your cell phone uh, rang uh, earlier, it took you eight seconds to take your cell phone. I, I counted eight seconds just to, to turn it down. Okay, but the ambulance, it's quicker than this. So it takes two seconds exactly to come. The guy doesn't bleed. The guy is put on the stretcher on the right leg where he presumably received a bullet. And he, doesn't, uh, and he doesn't complain. And let me tell you something. The guy, when he receives a bullet from this direction, instead of falling in this direction, he makes a jump on one meter on the other direction. I'll show you tomorrow. And it has two, two cameramen filming him while he was receiving the, the bullet. So uh, I... Yeah, uh, okay, the first thing is, is come exactly tomorrow, we'll you can tomorrow. argue with me tomorrow on that. I, as I said, come all of you, I'll offer a dinner for all of you. I remember I, I was able to. Okay, and we can have dinner for those who want to have dinner after whatever. And uh, provocation in filter, I'm telling you, yes, it provokes your, your brain because you have to understand that you're, you've been brainwashed about this news report. You believe it's true, it's a full hoax, it's bullshit, and I think it's very important now for the people in the world to understand that if you support the Palestinian cause, which I respect very much, first you should be happy to hear that this boy was not killed, at least one, and I'm telling you, someone who wants to support the Palestinian cause using this, if you look at the figures, you have 1,000 Israeli killed, 5,000 uh, Arabs killed. So I'm telling you, it's a very, very bad provocation. And you know, I remember people in France were saying, Jacques Chirac is the best friend of the Arabs. I'm telling you, no. Jacques Chirac was the best friend of the Arab dictators. He was receiving money from them, he was selling them weapons, and he was making like a whole mafia. But if I'm a friend of the Arabs, I'm telling you, I don't tell them, go at war for me. I'm quietly in the Elysee Palace, and I'm having fun. Thank you very much. Tomorrow, at mine here, and you'll be thank you. surprise. <laughs> thank you, Philippe. And can I ask you to thank all the panelists here, who, and, uh, and thank you for your contribution. And uh, to any young journalist, I would say uh, the new world in which we live is full of people like Philippe, uh, whatever you think of their motivations and their passions, and you have to be prepared to deal with them. So get used to